Um, my name is Matthew, and I'm here um, from the Smithsonian uh, Museum of Na Asian Art. Um, and then I also am joined by colleagues at the Smithsonian's American Art Museum. Um, we're here today to celebrate Lunar New Year. We're so excited that you're here. Now is a great time before we get started to make sure that you have your supplies ready for the art making activity. Um, and we'd love to hear either some questions or things that you have in the chat before we get started. Awesome. Uh, cool. So I see that we have people from all over the country here, um, people from Chicago and all over. Um, someone is really curious about the, it looks like maybe a stamp, the second one um, to the left, it looks like it has horns. Um, and I think that's Ellen could tell us a little bit about that artwork. Um, someone just kind of wondered what it was and why it's a standing. Oh, okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm Ellen. Um, so that is, um, it's a tile. So if you look at it closely, it's made out of clay or ceramic, fired clay. And you can see it's an ox. It's not quite like the other ox. It's standing up and it's holding, it kind of looks like a human with an ox head, but it's the same idea of, of showing that's one of a bunch of tiles and it shows all 12 signs of the zodiac. And so the one we're talking about today is the ox because it's the year of the ox for Lunar New Year this year. Um, one other question before we get started um, is that ox and cows look similar uh, and wondered if they're part of the same family. And I think Leah actually answered that question for us earlier this week. So I'm going to let her um, weigh in on that. Hey, yeah, I mean, I had the same question and so I just had to Google it, but I think they're kind of the same thing. Um, just slightly different. I think it depends on the year, how old a cow is, if it can be considered an ox. Um, and if they do things like pulling carts and if they work for a living, then they're called ox. That's great. <laughs> um, I do see some people also wanted to know what our jobs are and we'll get to that in a few minutes um, because we're gonna introduce ourselves formally. Um, but before we do that, um, I quickly wanted to introduce one of my colleagues, Yin Ying Chen, and she's going to actually tell us a little bit more about the Lunar New Year um, and how it's celebrated. Good so morning. Mm -hmm. Hi, <laughs> sorry, Matthew. So, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Yin Ying, also from the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. So yeah, before we really get started, um, I just want to share with you um, uh, what arts uh, symbolize in Chinese culture. So uh, traditionally, China, it's a ag agriculture society. Uh, so um, arts as well as buffalo are the main element for ensuring planting, farming, and harvesting. Uh, in other words, uh, they are very important element. element. And also they have a very close relationship to farmers. And generally they are known as being uh, very hardworking, uh, trustworthy and um, diligent. So uh, th these are also the characteristic of people who are born in the year of Acts. And uh, now let me tell you more about Lunar New Year. If we can go to the next slide. So Lunar New Year is also known as Spring Festival. And uh, Lunar New Year, as you can see in the pictures, it has a distinct tie, tie to food traditions. So like in Taiwan, where I was born and raised, um, shopping for New Year decorations and like, um, dry foods, candies, and curious meats in the open air markets. It's a beloved tradition. And also um, it's basically a 15 day of celebration field of feast at home of family and friends. And most of the foods you are uh, eaten during new year have some symbolic meaning. For instance, a fish symbolize uh, a wish for abundance in the coming year. And if we can go to the next slide. So uh, Lunar New Year, um, it uh, concludes with uh, Lantern Festival. And uh, around Lantern Festival, uh, temples, park, and like 
streets are all brightened up with uh, an ocean of lanterns. So the lanterns um, uh, can be very simple, like the one you see on the right. And it's also, the design can also be very delicate and uh, complicated, like the one you see on the left. And one of my favorite Lunar New Year childhood memory happened to be uh, carrying around lanterns um, in the neighborhood my, with my cousins. So now with our ado, let me turn it over back to Matthew. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Yinying. That was really great. Um, one person asked in the chat if um, ox is something that people eat. I know that because they're so similar to cows, um, you know, they can be eaten. I know that they're eaten here in the United States as well, but I didn't know if that was a part of a Lunar New Year tradition at all. Eating ox or? Yeah, someone was curious. I don't think it is a Lunar New Year tradition. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Yeah, you don't have to eat ox. Mostly you have like a reddish because it symbolizes you can move higher in the next year. Or fish, as I just shared, it's about like uh, abundance. So yeah, it's not something you definitely eat during the yeah, New Year. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and so now we're going to start our workshop today. Um, and thank you, Yingying, for joining us uh, briefly. She might not be staying through the whole program, but she was just going to help us with this introduction now. Thank you all. So today we're here for our Art and Me program. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide, Laura, um, I think it's a great time for us to introduce our speakers. Today we're going to be focusing on, since it's the year of the ox in Lunar New Year, um, different ox-related artworks in our collection. Um, my name is Matthew Lesnowski. I'm at the Freer and Sackler, which is the National Museum of Asian Art. Um, and I work in our education department. And I'm going to turn it over to Ellen, who also works with me at the Freer and Sackler, um, but has a slightly different role. Hi, everybody. Like Matthew said, I work with him at the Freer and Sackler, the National Museum of Asian Art. Um, but I am an objects conservator. And we'll talk a little bit more about what conservators are a little later on, but but basically a conservator um, is someone who works with the collections and we'll talk a little bit more about how. Um, and now I'm gonna have you um, meet Leah, who is also a conservator, but at a different museum at the Smithsonian. Hey everybody, thank you for being here today. As Ellen said, I'm also an objects conservator. And instead of being at the Freer and Sackler, I'm at the Smithsonian's American Art Museum. And so is my colleague who can introduce herself next. Thanks, Leah. So my name is Laura Hoffman and I also get to work with Leah at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, which we sometimes call SAM for short. And I also work at the Lunder Conservation Center within SAM. And my job as the program manager is to offer programs just like the one we are doing today. So we're very happy to be here. So just like I was saying earlier, Leah and I are both conservators. And so I'm wondering, has any, have any of you heard of the word conservator before? Do you know, do you know what it means? Do you have an idea of what we might do for our job? Um, talk about it a little bit. And if you have some ideas, it'd be great. Put them in the chat so we can, we can. Um, so what do you think a conservator might do? This is, this is a conservator who I work with in the picture. Take a look and see if you notice anything about her. I see somebody said fix pots. You're right. That is one of the things that I do. <laughs> um, and yes, we preserve, we work to preserve the art. Someone, I see someone else said. Um, so what we do as conservators is we work with the collection and we're kind of like the doctors for the artwork. So just like when you go to the doctor, sometimes you go to the doctor and they check up on you and make sure that you're okay. And then sometimes when you're not feeling well, you go and then they help you feel better. And we do the same thing for objects. So sometimes we just, we always look really closely just the way the doctor looks at you really closely and examines you to see how you're doing. And then sometimes we need to treat the artwork and sometimes we just do other things that help it stay healthy. Um, and so take a look in this picture, see if you notice anything a little unusual that you might not wear every day. Is there anything you notice that doesn't, doesn't look like something you would be wearing in your house right now? What do you notice on the conservator's hands? Do you see anything special? Do you see anything different? Gloves, right. So, so 
So I have gloves like that too, see? So the reason we wear these gloves is because your hands naturally have oils on them that can hurt the artwork. And so we always um, either, sometimes we wash our hands really well, but, but if it's something sensitive, we'll wear gloves. Um, and then the other thing, I don't know if you can see it as well because it's behind the words, but we also use magnification. So here's the mine, you can see it. This is called, this kind is called an optivizer, but it helps you see things really well. And for those of you, I know sometimes people can't see the images when the, the people talking when the slides are up. So I'll show you a little later too, but it helps us look really closely because the first thing we do with any artwork is look really closely and see um, what's happening with the artwork. So if, if anybody has any other questions, you can put them in the chat, um, but otherwise maybe we'll move on to the next one and talk a little bit more about conservation. So this is my desk <laughs> on a very busy day. So this gives you an idea of some of the tools that I use. And there are lots of different things there that you might notice. Um, and a little later on, we'll have a chance to talk about tools more and then you can ask me some questions, but maybe take a quick look and see if you notice anything that looks familiar to you on my desk that you might use or you've seen before. Paintbrushes, right, right. So I, paintbrushes and paint and, and um, swabs, and we'll talk all about those a little bit more later, but it gives you some of the ideas of tools I might use sometimes. So if we can go to the next one. And now Laura is gonna tell you a bit about the project you guys are gonna be doing. Yes, thank you, Ellen. And thanks for giving us the, all those great introductions. So we wanted to start getting your hands busy since we are gonna be doing the art making component as well. So for this part, if you haven't already, take out your materials. We made it super broad this time around because we've seen so many different types of inspiration and you'll see some of our examples as well as some examples at the museum as you guys are working. Um, so for this, we pretty much said anything you can dream up of because what we're, you're going to do is make your own ox toy sculpture. So here are some suggestions. You could use modeling clay, you could use popsicle sticks, um, pipe cleaners also known as chenille stems, toilet paper roll, cardboard, cotton balls, bottle caps, really whatever you'd like. I'm gonna demo right now for you and we can make start to make one together and you can keep making it as we show you more inspiration. So let me show you the next slide. Oops, there we go. So what I have here to start is just a cork. So what I'm gonna first do is I'm gonna draw on a, a little face right here. I'm gonna put on some eyes, and the nose and some a circle right here. So you can see here, I've got just a little start of a face. And I know that ox, oxen are, are known to have some horns. So I have a twist tie here and I kind of made it where it just has, you can see here, little, little purple horns, why not? It's what I had and I think it's fun to make it colorful. Now I got a little, a little makings of an ox. And as we'll see, I noticed that some of the ox that we're gonna see later are drawn, they often are um, drawing a, a cart. So I thought that would be fun. So what I need to, in order to attach this, to my cart is I'm gonna use some twi other twist ties and make kind of like a harness. So I'm just gonna push this right on here. Again, mine's the very quick way. You'll see some more beautiful examples after. And then of course I need my cart. So here I have this empty box and I have some bottle caps. So I'm gonna use, I need something to stick them on. I'm just gonna use some tape. So I'm going to put some tape on here and I'm just going to stick them on very easily like this. So now I've got a very rough cart and the last thing I need to do is try and attach it together like this. So here is my very quick, whoops, I definitely need some better adhesive, but you can see here a little cart. I would recommend, again, you can see, I use different, many different materials and I just had used what I had. So what we're going to do now is have you guys continue on. I'm going to pass this over to my colleagues so you can see some different examples while you guys are working to get inspired. Um, later in the portion, we are going to be doing a virtual show and tell. So what we're gonna do is have you guys email us pictures if you want 
We have so many people here. I'll probably take the first 10 and any others that we get that don't show faces, we'll use and put in our learning lab so that you guys can show them on later on. All right, so I'm gonna turn this over to Ellen for some inspiration. Sorry, thanks, Laura. So this is a piece that we have in the freer. Um, and it shows, like she was talking about, it shows an ox um, pulling a cart. And so um, I don't know the exact dimensions of this, but it's it's about, about this big, it's not too big. And it almost kind of looks like it might be a toy, but it's actually not a toy. It's part of a, it would have been part of a group of different figures that would have been together in a tomb to show what life would have been like. Um, but it's a, it's a good um, example to look at in terms of talking about how we might take care of some of the artwork that shows ox in our collection. So while you're making your artwork, also maybe take a minute and take a look at this and tell me if there's anything you notice about this. Is there anything special about it you see? that catches your attention or makes you think, question, makes you ask questions. What kind of questions do you have? And so while you're thinking about that, I can tell you a little bit. This is from China, probably around the sixth century. Um, and it, it does kind of look like a horse a little bit, right? Cause it's, it's drawing, it's pulling a cart, but it's actually an ox. If you look a little closely, it has, those are horns sticking up and you can see the shape isn't quite like a horse. It's a little bit different. Um, and some other things you can notice, um, what's in the cart? Well, um, you can't really see it from here, but often what happens is um, that, um, that there's a person inside. Um, and I'm trying to see what some other questions there are. So why is there a red circle symbol on it? Oh, okay. So actually, Laura, if you go to the next one, we can talk about there's some uh, more details. So I didn't make this. Someone was asking how I made this. This was made a really, really, really long time ago in China. I take care of it. So I try and keep it safe and make sure that it stays healthy so that you guys can come to the museum and see things like this. And then um, we try to keep them for a lot longer. So that, that red circle right there is actually a label from a very long time ago. Um, and it's a way in the museum, we don't ever put labels on that like, on things like that now anymore, but it was a way they would have put a number on it so they knew which object it was. And so I haven't actually taken that off because I don't know, if, can you see that there, the, it's more than one color, right? Do you see different colors on here? So this is the, the black color is the clay and then the white and the red and all those colors over it, those are, that's painted on top of it. And so the paint is actually pretty fragile because it's very old. And so I have to be very careful. So at some point I will take the label off, but it takes a lot of work to do it a special way because I don't want to pull the paint off. So in these two close-up pictures, you can look a little uh, a little bit more closely at some of the, the things and you see those kind of um, lines. Laura, can you point out the lines on the left side, the horizontal lines with the brown smears, the cracks? <laughs> oh, you can't, it's so, so on, the other, on the other one, on the cart. See how there are those lines there? Those are cracks because it's really fragile. And so at some point it broke. And so that's, it was put back together again, but you can still kind of see where the cracks are a little bit. And so it depends, sometimes we'll, we'll make those less visible, but for this piece, they're, they're there so you can see. And that way, you know, when you're handling it, how fragile it might be. And then the other really careful thing about handling this one is the paint, right? Remember how we were talking about, you can kind of see some of the paint's been lost. So I'm always, really careful when I'm holding something like this, I'll wear my gloves and try not to make any more paint come off when I'm holding it. Ellen, we have one question in the Q&A about mm -hmm. um, humidity or like water or moisture in the air and if that is a challenge for this artwork. Ah, that is a really good question. So luckily for this piece, um, it's not too bad because it's fired clay. So it means it's been heated really high and, and ceramics or fired clay is not quite as um, it's not as big a deal to have moisture in the air for that. Um, but we do have other things in the collection and some of the pieces Leah is going to talk about where it, it is a really big deal to have moisture in the air. And maybe she'll tell you a little bit about that for those because they are more sensitive. Um, and I think that in fact is a good time for Leah to tell you about some of the pieces, other ones we're going to have you look at today. Sure. Thanks, Ellen. So this is the first artwork in the Sam collection that I wanted to show you. And you might be able to see that it has many animals on it, not just oxen. And so if you can take a look, 
throw in the chat if you can see what other animals there are. Um, and while you're taking a look, um, this is a really cool object in our collection. Um, do you think it's a toy? T put in the chat if you think it's a toy. It definitely looks like it, um, but it's not actually a toy, although it would be super fun to play with. Um, it's actually a model for a merry-go-round that was made for Coney Island in New York City. Um, so I don't know, I wonder if you guys have been on a merry-go-round. I remember when I was little being on a merry-go-round and they generally just have horses. Um, but this one has five cows, a goat, a lion, a camel, a horse, and two sleighs that are each pulled by two more horses. Um, and so we actually have quite a lot of models in our collection, which are tiny versions of big things. So the tiny versions help to show how these big things work. Um, and while this isn't a toy, I hope it can give you some inspiration to make something really fun and unique and to use your imagination when you're making your ox toy. Um, but the next piece that I'll show you was actually made to be a toy. This is called Man, Ox Drawn Cart with Logs and Saw, Cow, Calf and Trough. <laughs> so it's kind of a long title. <laughs> um, there's a lot going on in this one. And I know I probably didn't give you a ton of time to look at that other one, but um, see what you think here. What's going on? What do you see? I have some of my own favorite parts of this toy, so I can share those with you a little bit later. Um, but while you look closely, you might think it's kind of weird for us in a museum to have toys in our museum collection, but toys can actually tell us a lot about the everyday lives of the people of the past. So this toy is from probably around the 1950s and was made on a farm. So this toy would have helped kids on the farm learn about what happens on a farm, how the ox are used to pull the carts and more about everyday life on a farm. Um, so if this were in a home, you know, you would move it around a lot. You could maybe change the clothes of the little person, um, could probably use it with other toys. Um, but in a museum, it has a totally different life. We are very careful to keep it just the way it was when it came into the museum. Like Ellen talked about earlier, we always wear gloves on our hands to keep the toy safe from any oils or anything we have on our hands. Um, and just like Ellen mentioned earlier about the humidity, for this piece, wood in particular can be really fragile and sensitive to water or to high humidity in the air. And so we want to keep that keep water away from this piece. Um, and that's why if it's stored, if it's not on view, we keep it in a nice fancy box to keep any dust from getting on it, to keep it from getting damaged by light and from that humidity that someone mentioned. Um, so as much fun as it would be to play with, in the museum we aren't play, we don't play with them because we wanna keep them safe and preserved for as long as possible so we can learn about farm life for many years in the future. And I haven't been looking at the chat, Matthew, were there any questions about this piece? No, um, okay. I didn't see any specific questions. Just oh, what I didn't. people are seeing. Okay, perfect. Well, I wonder, one of my favorite parts of this is there's actually a little baby. Um, I don't know if anyone could see that. You can see it better on the picture in the left, but there's a little baby, a little baby ox or baby cow. That's probably my favorite part. I also like that the farmer has a little blue hat on. That was very cute. Um, so I hope that gives you some inspiration too for your own ox toy. And we can keep going, Laura. And these are two that Ellen made, two little ox toys that Ellen made. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to say about them, Ellen? Nope. <laughs> Other than I had a lot of fun making them. Um, and um, I can't wait to see some of the ones that you guys are making. Could you just quickly share what, since they're different materials than the ones that I had just showed, which what materials you used? Oh, sure, yeah. So, so the red one is actually um, part of a paper towel roll um, that I painted red, and then it has um, pipe cleaner or chenille sticks for the horns, and then the other one um, is made out of uh, two um, parts of toilet paper rolls that I glued together, and then more pipe cleaners or chenille sticks. All right, so part of keeping our artworks and our sculptures safe at the museum, we as art doctors write reports about them. 
just like if you were at a doctor, you know, the doctor might scribble down some notes about what's going on with your own health. So we do that for the artworks. And you guys could do that for your own ox sculpture, just like we do at the museum. Then you can think about, you know, if you want to play with it or maybe also play with it, but think about how you would best preserve it if it was in a museum. So I would love if you guys could help me fill out this form for my sculpture, which is this is one that I made. I can also grab it behind me. I went a little wild with this. I had some pink tissue paper <laughs> Whoa. that I really loved. So I wanted to make it part of my ox sculpture. And so I made an ox out of a rolled piece of paper with the yellow is kind of hard to tell what's going on, but it's just one of those mesh things that you might get fruit in from the grocery store. And then just like Laura, I made a little cart out of some cardboard and it has little wheels that I made out of cardboard and some bamboo skewers. Um, and I used that tissue paper inside the cart and also to decorate the ox itself. Cause I just love that color. I will say Leah, that your construction is much more stable than my construction of my cart. <laughs> The bamboo skewer is a great idea. Thank you. And it actually, it doesn't move great, but it, the little wheels move. I was very proud of myself. <laughs> um, but anyway, so to start this art doctor report for this artwork or this toy, um, first up is the art doctor or conservator's name, which could be your name, but in this case is me, Leah. And the art name, I don't know if you guys could think of a good name for my little ox and cart. If you have an idea of what you would call that, it could really use a good title. Um, maybe I would call it pink ox and cart or something like that. I don't know. Festival cart, that was the first one I saw. That's a great, I love that. It is very festive. Um, so you can title your artwork, whatever you would like. And then the next in examination is what three words best describe your artwork? And are, what three words would you use to describe my wild, brightly colored ox cart? Um, maybe, I don't know, yellow, pink, paper. Those are some good words. Um, it's also kind of delicate. You could describe the condition of your artwork pink, cardboard. Oh, pretty. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so this paper is pretty, it's pretty delicate. Um, so you can think about for your artworks, what might describe them. And then which emoji, I was very happy when I made this. So probably the happy emoji or maybe the sunglasses one. And then the next question is, what can you do to take care of your art? So for this one, just like I was talking about, for the other artworks in our collection, um, I, you know, I want, I still kind of want to play with this and move it around, but I'm going to be very careful when handling it. And I would wash my hands before I touch it to make sure that I don't get it dirty. And maybe I would also try to keep it away from water, particularly because of that tissue paper. If it gets wet, the color is going to go everywhere. Um, so maybe keep it out of a place like the bathroom where it could get really humid and wet. Um, and probably keep it away from the window, which could help, which the light would fade that bright, bright color. Um, and then on the bottom of that form, if you want, you can make a little drawing of your artwork. And so then in the future, you could know what it looks like when you first made it. So anyways, I hope that helps to demonstrate the art doctor report and how you can use it to keep track of the condition of your ox toys that you guys make. So thank you for your help. Great, thank you, Leah. Um, and now we're going to do the second part, which is our virtual show and tell. So some people have already started emailing me, please do at dwrclunder at si.edu. We won't be able to get to everyone, but we'll get to the first ones that come up. So please have them come in. Um, before I turn off the, the PowerPoint part, I do wanna say, um, as kind of after this program, I encourage you guys to take a look around in your home and your community, see what kinds of toys do you have lying around. Um, I'm curious which one's your favorite and what materials that they are made out of. As we saw, 
Ours were made out of all different types of materials. And also think about as you as an art doctor or conservator, a budding one, um, how would you store them so that they will say, stay safe? So just have those thinking. Um, for this part, I'm going to take off the PowerPoint. And I know Ellen's going to show some of those uh, tools that she had mentioned while we're getting those emails to come in. I'm also going to stop the recording for this part. Um, so for the recorded part, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll get started now on this, this second half of our program.